Facebook uh, also acquired Belarusian startup Masquerade over 100 million dollars. And the Belarusian startup Flow. The startup attracted 12 million in investment in in round A. Uh, Belarusian IT ma market will known uh, outsourcing companies, YEPAM, <coughs> and uh, 1,000 uh, IT companies. Uh, Belarus, uh, uh, Minsk uh, recently uh, Said a new law, a digital economy initiative designed to simplify business for uh, tech, tech companies. According to the law, the following uh, technological tracks and the uh, and uh, a new focus: artificial and uh, intelligence. Neural uh, networks, blockchain, um, crypto uh, currency, we are big data and our sourcing activity. Uh, I will be uh, glad uh, to you see in Belarus. I am invited in our uh, in, uh, investment uh, startup uh, events. Thank you, you. Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you. So now uh, we're welcoming Tobias to talk uh, with us about uh, a new national policy in Kenya that uh, is very surprising and I think. Uh, also internationally attractive for other countries to replicate, which is the policy of uh, Savannah Valley. Uh, I'm very keen about uh, knowing more uh, on this project and uh, how you intend to develop it, implement it in the following years. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first is to thank the organizers for this uh, important event and for the invitation to be able to join you. Uh, I'm sorry for being late because we ran round and round looking for the venue up there. But finally we are here and we are glad to join you in this very important discussion. Oh, I was asked to talk about uh, the policies and the ecosystem climate uh, as an international policy expert on these issues. And uh, first I want to say that uh, it's amazing how human beings are always very innovative. It's problems that make us be able to invent new things to be able to find solutions. And uh, because of that, we've seen challenges that were in the 1950s, we can now find their solutions now. But as we find these solutions, the problems become very much complicated. So each and every time, we as human beings have to find solutions to this. Now, when it comes to businesses and startups and investors, in terms of policy proclamations, the first thing is to be able to make the right policies. Development, development, and the development can never take place without the right policies and the right strategies. So that's the first thing. So what are these kind of policies that we need to do, for example? If you look at Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, we have been encouraged to leave no one behind. In other words, the way the world has been growing before is a situation where we have some few rich people and the majority are poor. And this has been established to be unsustainable. So right now we have so many multinational companies, big companies, 
that have dominated the market, and we have young people who have a lot of talents, but they don't have the financial power and the financial wherewithal to be able to do their businesses. So the first thing that has to be done is to be able to see how we can be able to empower in terms of policies and legislations we make in our countries. How do we make legislations that are able to bring young people that are graduating from universities to be able to make their businesses take off? Because if there are no policies to this particular line, then they would start these businesses, but then they lose out because they're bigger boys outside in the market. So the first policy should be that of inclusivity. In my own country, we are trying to do this a lot. We even started uh, what we call Ways of Fund. Ways of Fund is basically a fund that the, the, the government set aside to be able to attract young people who are graduating from universities, from colleges, but do not have money, but they can get this money so that they start their businesses and they try it. So these are some of the policies we put in place. The other thing that we're trying to do I'd scribble some notes here, so don't worry when I, 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 I pick some points on them. Thank you. So that I was talking about the policies and the ecosystems as they're very important for making the innovation landscape more feasible for investors and startups to thrive. As I was saying, if we do not have the right policies, there is no person, there is no company that is going to put their money in anything. Because businesses, uh, people who do businesses are about making profit. They are about governments that are able to enforce contracts. Because if you are a business person and you want to come and do business in Kenya and you are not sure whether you will be able to make your money, then that kind of anxiety brings problems. So the first policy, inclusivity. The second, governance. And that governance has to be one that assure investors and starters that their businesses are safe and secure and they'll be able to make profits. The other thing that I wanted to say with regard to this, because now we're thinking locally but acting globally. In other words, the challenges we have today they may look local, but they are not. For example, climate change. It's a global problem, but the way we approach it in Kenya could be different from the way we approach it from the global north. So how do we therefore be able to use our, our techniques and policies and tools that work for climate change for all? We do think that some of these are supposed to measure, uh, policies are supposed to be uh, an internalization process. When you have, for example, people doing issues on climate change in Africa, they should also be able to link up with other people, companies, doing policies on the same across the continents. For example, you have people in Europe working on climate smart agriculture, and we have this problem in Africa because the rains are very erratic. We should be able to have policies that can link people or investors from Europe who have a lot of knowledge on climate smart agriculture to be able to work with their counterparts in Africa. And we do this a lot in Kenya. Uh, you know, my country is one of the countries that are, uh, is doing heavily on green uh, energy or renewable energy. And we are opening it up. We look working with the Japanese companies, the American companies, and the rest. So it is always policy and policy and policies. The other thing I wanted to mention with that uh, is to be able to bridge the gap between the innovation system. We have countries that are well developed on this um, from the part of the world where I come from. Um, maybe the teaching of science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics has not really uh, gotten to a level comparable to the north. So this is one of the areas where we are also putting in resources so that we can empower our people, we can have better laboratories, but then we also encourage research and development 
especially for universities and research institutions to collaborate. Again, it's a matter of policies and policies and policies. The other thing I wanted to talk about is about the infrastructure. It is very difficult to do business without infrastructure. And when I talk about infrastructure, the roads, the telecommunication, the education system, and the whole lot of it. This has to be put in place. Uh, you see right now, my country, Kenya, is actually leading in mobile telephony, that technology. We are the first country in the world to try to use mobile phones to do businesses. And this is amazing coming from an African country. We started this project in 2007, and today internet penetration in Kenya is 85%. And Kenya is one of the countries with a high literacy level, which stand at 87% of the Kenyan population has, a, 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 has an education beyond all level, ordinary level, of what we call uh, uh, Form 4 in Kenya. So we have this, uh, we have technology uh, that started one, the first one was the M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a, a, an app where you can download money in your phone and do your shopping, do you pay your bills, in the comfort of your sofa set at home. When I am in Kenya, or right here in Italy, I send money to Kenya in my office. I only need to load it on my phone and then send it, and my mama or whoever I'm doing business with in Kenya is able to receive that money real time. So, again, policies. When we opened up, the government opened up the communication sector, the uh, 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 information and technology communication, and made it secure for people who are able to do this. The other thing uh, I wanted to mention is with regard to collaboration between multinational companies and domestic companies. And this is very important. In every opportunity, there is something that we can learn from. Uh, we have multinational companies that have come to Kenya, for example, to do businesses, but then each market is unique. They came to realize they're not going to penetrate the market so well, but there were young people who would come up with uh, uh, applications that could enable them to be able to reach even the interior parts of the country. So that kind of collaboration between those powerful countries our powerful multinational organizations and young people who are still coming up on board is very, very important. Sometimes, uh, this has happened before, that uh, people start uh, businesses or applications, then it doesn't do well, then they lose the money. There is no further funding. So I think there needs to be some kind of feasibility study done to be able to see whether this kind of business is likely to prosper or not. Because any businesses, when they start, they must have challenges. So we have to build the challenges. And we should always know that a challenge is an opportunity. Of course. We have to improve on it. So there is also one thing I needed to say about uh, the policies. Uh, this is about integrating the markets. Uh, sometimes it is very difficult, especially if you're dealing with a country where we have a small market. Because at the end of the day, it's about how much profit am I going to make if I enter this market. So one of the things, and we are now leading into this, uh, as you're aware, uh, the first region in the world that ever came up with an integrated market was East Africa. We had the East Africa community in 1977, but for some reasons it didn't work so well. We have revived this. Now we have the East Africa community again, but now not three countries. We are six countries, and the idea was to be able to create a larger market which is economically and socially uh, uh, feasible. Of that kind of market alone to date has a, a population of 
over slightly over three million, uh, 300 million people. That is uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo has applied, South Sudan has joined it. So this, we are trying to integrate this so that we create a larger market when businesses venture into that market, there is economic sense to do business. This is a very good experience. I, I think we can also jump on this to start talking about Europe and about how the European startup ecosystem actually grew up in the last years and is now more and more connected. Uh, I would like you to introduce you once again, uh, Thomas, but b before that, please, Florian, welcome to the stage from uh, Munich, the municipality of Munich. Please come here. So Thomas, uh, tell us more about uh, your activities, what you're doing, and most of all about this new acceleration program uh, for building startup ecosystem, because we're talking about this right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, see. Sì, grazie. Eh, grazie mille per avermi. Io inizio in italiano solo per chiedere una domanda al pubblico, perché mi interessa sempre la gente che lavorano dentro l'ecosistema e per quello vorrei chiedere cosa pensate voi dell'ecosistema di startup di Roma. Cosa pensate? Pensate che in comparazione con gli altri ecosistemi in Europa siete forti o siete scarsi? Dove, dove pensate siete? Cosa, cosa è l'impressione delle persone che lavorano dentro? Chi lavora dentro l'ecosistema roma, romano? Sì, qualcuno, ok, calcola. Forte, alza, alza il mano. Chi pensa che siete forti? Chi pensa che siete forse un po' scarso in comparazione? Qualcuno pensa scarso? Poi tanto no? gli farò delle domande, Qualsiasi? lo facciamo ah, alla scarso lì. <ride> Un, una è onesta. Poi lo farò. <ride> ok, interessante. So, cambio in inglese. Sorry, I switch back to, to English now. Just, uh, I wanted to ask the audience how they feel about their own ecosystem and uh, to get a little bit of a, a feeling of um, what, what people are perceiving is happening here in Rome. So I myself, I work for seven years now with startup ecosystems. Um, I'm also from Munich, so I have a, a <laughs> friend over there. Um, but I don't live in, in, in Munich anymore, but in Italy now. Um, and I've roamed many, many different uh, ecosystems in, in Europe. And I have two points to make, so it's not going to be extremely long. So uh, the first point that I, um, um, that I want to make has to do very much with what we do at the Startup Heatmap Europe, which is the organization that I founded about three years ago. It is basically an intelligence provider for ecosystems. Um, we, are, we are a non-profit. Uh, we're looking at how dynamic our ecosystems, how are they developing, and we're developing mostly metrics that go beyond the usual investment raised metric. So we think it doesn't help you to look at the number of investments you raised because it's going to be always a couple of years too late for you to act on your ecosystem. If you have a 10 million investment raised, that's normally the result of your work of three years past. So to advise you in your daily work, you need to look at metrics that are, that are closer to what's happening on the ground. So the first point I want to make is about what are ecosystems? And there's two scenarios that you, that you have. Either, simplified, either an ecosystem is a city. Second is, an ecosystem is actually a network of actors. A lot of people, especially stakeholders, tasked with the task of building ecosystems start with perspective A. And I really hope they are wrong. Because if ecosystems were a city, you would be doomed. Rome would have no chance. There is no way you can compete as an ecosystem of Rome with what's out there. We can start with comparisons to Berlin, Paris, London, forget it already. But then we go to China, we go to the US, no chance. So let's hope for all of us that scenario two applies, that an ecosystem actually is a system of actors that work together on building something. In this case, it makes a lot of sense to look at connections. And this is what we do at the Startup Heatmap Europe. We're looking at 
how founders in startups, how tech talent, how investors, how different actors that are involved in the creation of startups are connecting across borders, across localities. And um, we've seen that, Chile, you said you have Italian founders in your program. You have 58 countries in your portfolio, you said. How many countries in your portfolio do you have? 85. 85, oh, even more. Okay, so 85. So I recently looked at the accelerator here in Rome, Lewis N Labs. How many foreign startups did you have in Lewis N Labs here in, in Rome? Foreign, foreign founders. Zero. There's nothing. So uh, th these are some points to, to look into. If you, if you don't have connections, if you don't use these instruments you have, to bring in founders, you have a problem. The other point is we saw, uh, we saw Angola is a strong network. Actually, you have a strong connection with Portugal. I'm often in, in Lisbon. You have a lot of founders going back and forth with, uh, with Angola. Um, they speak Portuguese, so that is like a, there's a big, uh, big connection here. So there's, there's all these connections happening. I'm often in, uh, in actually in the Baltic states, Lithuania, very close to Belarus, a lot of exchange going on. These places would have no chance if they wouldn't make these connections. And you have seen what Belarus has in terms of successful startups. There, there, is, a, there is a load of successful startups in this country. And that happens because these founders think internationally from the start. Okay, I stop about my first point. I think you got it. Internationality is key for building startup ecosystems and successful companies. Second point is um, we are something strange. We here all in a row. We are very strange people. We are not investors. Some of us might be at a second job, but uh, we are not investors generally. Um, we are not startups. We, don't, we didn't found anything, nothing that would make money. Um, what are we? We are a strange kind. We are, we are something that I would call ecosystem builders. It's a, rare, a quite fresh, quite young profession. Actually, there is no education for this. There is no training for this. There is um, there's basically just us going to conferences like this, on panels like this, trying to talk to each other and trying to learn what the hell we should be doing. That's why actually we like more talking to each other than to you guys. <laughs> because it's very important for our professional lives that we learn what actually we need to do. Um, the organization I'm representing, the European Startup Initiative, which is also the Startup Heatmap Europe, um, we've started to try to bring up something for this kind of profession. We said we need to do more training. We need to help each other out. And we started an accelerator program, not for startups, but we started an accelerator program for ecosystem builders where they learn the concepts of ecosystem building, the latest knowledge, and have the chance to exchange, sit down with other peers, and develop strategies for bringing their ecosystem forward. And um, yeah, this is, a, this is a program we run several times a year. Next edition is actually in Lisbon. You're more than invited. <laughs> and um, there uh, we will have on 6th and 7th of June the offline workshop for two days of intensive, um, uh, intensive um, yeah, brainstorming and working on strategies. Before that, we have four weeks of online courses. So whoever is interested in learning about how you build ecosystems, you're more than invited to, to join, just, just ask me afterwards. And if anything that I said offended you, please, let's discuss about it. I'm more than open about it. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> and now, talking about building startup ecosystem, uh, when, I, when I had to start uh, with John Marco to concretize all our ambition about building a fertile ground here in Rome, one of the most prom pr prominent models we had at the international level was, without any doubt, the city of Amsterdam. Uh, because since the beginning, they were very active and also very propositive in contacting all the other cities in Europe. I would like to welcome Korea and let her explain what was the, the journey to arrive here, and uh, most particularly the project scale, which is connecting cities all over Europe. Thank uh, you. I think it's better. I don't 
Okay. So I will speak first on Startup Amsterdam and then uh, and how we build our ecosystem and then I will talk a little bit more about a network that we built together here with our uh, neighbors, Milano, Roma and uh, Munich. Um, so I think everybody here probably knows Amsterdam very well for uh, the cannabis and the prostitutes. <laughs> we have a lot of Italians in Amsterdam by the day. Um, but no, it's actually a really, really vibrant, innovative hub now for small businesses and young people starting up. Um, we started our program of Startup Amsterdam in 2015. And over the last four years, I have to say, uh, we have brought the ecosystem so far that even we cannot keep up with it at the moment. Um, we built Startup Amsterdam based on the idea that we wanted to put Amsterdam on the map as a, as a place to come and set up your business alongside our competitors of London, Berlin, Paris. Um, and over the years we've run a number of initiatives that fall under five key pillars that we believed were crucial for this kind of development that is creating capital, making sure there is talent, making sure that you have the right content, making sure that you give your startups access to customers, and number five, creating a really strong environment for your entrepreneurs. So this is through events, through a number of projects like teaching primary and secondary school children how to code because developing is the future uh, for a lot of these young children. Um, and essentially, yes, if I could, I've not got the slides, but I, I know some of the figures that we have now simmering between 1,200 to 2,000 startups in Amsterdam's, uh, greater Amsterdam's area. This is a very hard figure to keep track of, of course, but when you include scale-ups, and that I mean uh, those, those companies that are perhaps ready to go out into the world because they have a scalable business model, we're looking at around 1,600. Um, we have about 5,000 events a year going on in Amsterdam. It's a little bit uh, too much sometimes, but we keep going and uh, trying to make an impact on people like you here. Um, and actually something I just want to speak about briefly since I have these guys with me is under one of our pillars is internationalization, and that is to connect with our partners in Europe, because in Amsterdam we believe very strongly that you can learn from each other, and instead of competing with each other as cities, you should complement each other. Europe, in the end, is out there to face some of the bigger giants in the world, and I really believe passionately that we should do this together. So, together we built this international network with cities like Rome, Milan, and uh, Munich here. And we decided to collaborate and share our best practices and learn from each other. And recently we are taking this one step further and we are going to concretely uh, work on projects together and try to build this European ecosystem rather than local uh, city ecosystems. Um, I will not, won't ramble on, but I'm really available for any questions, any more information you want to know about Amsterdam. I do believe we have a good example, but we are also still learning very much. And um, yeah, I'd love to talk to you after. Of course. Thank you. And now, Elisa, please, uh, tell us more about Milan, about the strategy of the municipality and about future ambition of the city to become a startup hub, uh, not only in Italy, but in Europe. Um, first of all, um, hello, ciao. I'm very happy to be here because even if I represent the municipality of Milan, I'm from Rome, and so I'm very happy to be back home. Uh, I prepared um, a little presentation, and first I will try to give you brief numbers of the ecosystem in Milan, what we did and what we are doing to, um, to make this ecosystem more solid. 
And then I want also to have a look uh, um, at the future. So where are we headed, where, what we uh, want to do, and what are for us the main um, pillars of, for um, a future uh, strategy. So, um, Elisa, Elisa. C'è quella di Amsterdam. Quindi... No problem. Um, so, uh, Milan is an important hub for the startup, uh, for the Italian startup ecosystem. In fact, uh, uh, Milanese innovative startups comprises 17% of the national data and uh, around 71% of the regional data. Uh, in the recent year, the municipality of Milan supported around 1,200 startups, uh, out of which around 266 are considered to be um, innovative. The municipality of Milan, um, in order to foster the startups ecosystems, uh, follows five main trajectories. The internationalization of projects, the ecosystem network project, direct financial support, innovative financial project, and it tries to spur the new economy skills and jobs, such as uh, manufacturing 4.0, or smart city, and the social innovation. And we will try now to go into more details of the, those five trajectories. The internationalization project aims at strengthen the, con the connection, hence the network, between Milan and other major uh, cities. For instance, since 2017, the municipality of Milan entered the uh, scale network, uh, which brings together about 20 of the main uh, European um, metropolis uh, and to promote the exchange of information and best practices among people that want to do uh, business uh, in the EU. So as you were saying, uh, it's what we are doing at the at a European level. We are, try we are trying to build an international network uh, so as not to be just one hub in Italy or if we consider also Rome, just be separate entities. So that startups can actually have the chance to move from a local scope to an international scope. On the same subject, we have uh, stipulated, stipulated a bilateral agreement with the city of New York for the exchange of startups. We all know that it's fundamental to have international connections and to build an international ecosystem. However, it's as important to have a strong, solid, vivid internal ecosystem made by well, working uh, fab labs or uh, accelerators and incubators that will actually give the startups the competencies, uh, the skills that will enable them to be able to compete uh, uh, at a global level or in general international or even national level. Um, in this concern, the municipality of Milan has invested a lot in both uh, accelerators and uh, incubators. Uh, and another important aspect uh, to help uh, um, to help startups uh, grow and acquire new skills is through maker spaces and fab labs, uh, uh, which are uh, which are co-working spaces in which uh, the innovators can actually experiment their ideas and work together. So to have also a combination of knowledge, with it, which is fundamental for innovation. Today, Milan, with to have maker spaces and fab labs registered in the municipality's qualified list, is the first city in Italy and one of the first in Europe by the number of digital manufacturing laboratories. The municipality offers direct support to startups both through grants and investing directly in the, um, in the incubators and accelerators. However, we are also trying to pursue innovative way of financing, uh, such as uh, microcredits and civil crowdfunding. In a time of 4.0 technology transformation, the municipality aims to be the enabling platform that fosters interaction between present and future actors, the circulation of the best experiences among the peers. Consequently, in April 2017, it was launched the program Manifattura Milano, which is directed to startups and SMEs. The goal of the program is to make Milan an enabling ecosystem for the birth, establishment, and growth of startups and enterprises that want to work in the field of digital manufacturing. Inside this, this, big, pro this big project, it was organized the first edition of Manifatture Aperte, a day in which the uh, fabrics, the 
laboratories, the workshop, the academies, open their doors to the general public. On the same subject, in July 2018, it was launched the project Meter su Bottega, which consisted in a call directed to startups and SMEs that wanted to establish their business at the suburb of the city. The three main pillars were urban regeneration of peripheral neighborhoods, female self-employment and self-entrepreneurship, and new artisan enterprises. It was a challenge of social innovation because uh, we wanted the, the entrepreneurial activities to generate both economic value and social inclusion. To conclude, we also, uh, together with Invitalia, the municipality of Milan decided to create an incubator named Smart City Lab. It will be used to support the entrepreneurial projects inspired by the theme of Smart City and it, in all its articulations, and it will be launched in, two, in 2020. It will have a dual function. On the one hand, it will be an incubator. So it will, only, uh, it will not only support uh, from a financial point the startups, but it will also pursue action of teaching, mentorship, and also have, have them access to capital. On the other hand, it will be a showroom to, of the best solutions offered by the market. All of the aforementioned are just examples of what the municipality of Milan is doing to foster the uh, startup ecosystem and how we are chasing uh, all the opportunities to create a positive environment for startups and therefore innovation to develop and scale. But what's the future? Where are we headed? What, what, what should we do also as a municipality? So for us, there are three main things. First of all, we have to focus on sustainable development. As we were saying before, we cannot divide sustainability from, econ from economy. The two things have to go together. And on this regard, the municipality is focusing of Milan. We are focusing on, a lot on circular economy. And we are trying to find measures that sustain the companies that offer services and products on the circular optic. On this regard, we, all, we have also separated an agreement with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on two vertical aspects which are fundamental for the Milanese economy, food and fashion. The second point is to pursue open innovation on some verticals. Um, on some verticals. For instance, we and the Fondazione Cariplo have opened a call on the vertical of food that uh, will select both companies and startups and then we will try to connect them and this is very important. We have just closed the call for the uh, corporation and now the call for startup uh, is open. In the end, uh, we need to focus on unicorn, on, sorry, on ponies and not on unicorns. What does this mean? Does somebody know the concept of unicorns or ponies, shall I explain the, to the general? Okay. So, the unicorns are all the different digital declinations of startups. You know, the big ones that we saw, uh, Facebook or startup, or sorry, uh, WhatsApp. So, the, the, those digital companies then, then became huge. While the um, ponies or the good startups or the scale-ups uh, are all those companies that uh, um, will be the future medium large companies and that operate in the um, Italian ecosystem and that will eventually foster uh, the Italian um, ecosystem and the Italian entrepreneurial fabric. So um, the Italian entrepreneurial sector is indeed characterized by such companies that are related and linked to the territory and the work on the territory. And, um, we need to find innovative ways to scale them, attracting also investor attention. And in my opinion, uh, the event Scale It Capital is a good uh, platform to expose Italian startups for, um, to the uh, foreign public. Um, I'm happy to uh, respond to any question. And uh, again, thank you for having me here. Thank you very much.
quindi adesso con Francesca parleremo in italiano eh, è un esempio un po' atipico all'interno di questo panel perché Francesca è sul punto di costruire un nuovo progetto per l'ecosistema startup di Roma si tratta di un progetto di acceleratore incubatore eh, su una tematica che per noi è essenziale eh, direi quasi naturale per costituzione che è quella della cultura quindi la valorizzazione del patrimonio la valorizzazione anche del turismo attraverso la cultura e la possibilità di creare un polo che possa accompagnare le nuove imprese innovative su questo settore qua a Roma. Vorrei chiedere a Francesca come si costruisce un progetto del genere, cosa comporta e poi soprattutto qual è l'impatto sull'ecosistema startup locale. Grazie, grazie mille. Allora, eh, la sala è fatta da tanti ragazzi giovani, però credo che quelli un po' più grandi eh, nella loro storia avranno sentito tante volte da tutti i governi che si sono susseguiti in questo paese la famosa parola e frase eh, la cultura è il petrolio dell'Italia, peccato che sono decenni che questo famoso petrolio non viene estratto, perché non viene estratto? Perché non ci sono le competenze per farlo e spesso manca anche la volontà di farlo, ma quello che penso manchi principalmente sono le competenze che è poi il tema centrale che è stato toccato anche questa mattina perché il vero problema della cultura qual è? Il vero problema della cultura è che è tutto gestito dal pubblico, dalla pubblica amministrazione quindi la vera domanda è come si fa a creare uno, un ecosistema eh, di un settore che è completamente in mano pubblica perché questa è la vera sfida Credo non solo dell'Italia perché se voi pensate anche a livello internazionale eh, i settori che girano intorno alla cultura sono stati toccati un po' tutti dall'innovazione, pensate al travel, no? quindi tutto quello che è il turismo culturale in termini di numeri nel mondo è straordinario, pensate all'education, pensate all'entertainment, però non solo in Italia dobbiamo ragionare in questo momento ma in tutto il mondo, il mondo della cultura e dell'arte non è stato davvero toccato dal mondo dell'innovazione, ci sono in giro per il mondo delle start up che sono nate ma sono piccole realtà che non riescono poi a trovare un luogo fisico, quindi un paese, una città, che possa creare quelle condizioni, no? il famoso ecosistema di cui abbiamo parlato questa, questa mattina. Eh, io adesso tolgo ehm, il cappello della persona che vuole creare questo ecosistema eh, in Italia e mi metto il cappello di persona che lavora anche nel mondo delle istituzioni culturali, perché sono nel consiglio di amministrazione del Teatro dell'Opera, L'opera lirica, come sappiamo, è, è quello che rappresenta l'Italia del mondo, anche se molto spesso ce lo dimentichiamo, ed è l'unica cosa che fa parlare italiano agli altri paesi nel mondo. Ecco, eh, io nel 2013 quando sono arrivata al Teatro dell'Opera di Roma eravamo in una situazione economicamente difficile, abbiamo risanato il teatro, l'abbiamo rilanciato dal punto di vista artistico, ma mi sono accorta che è praticamente impossibile riformare le istituzioni culturali dall'interno, almeno non in tempi come dire, relativamente eh, brevi o medi. Allora su cosa ho ragionato? Sul fatto che l'unico modo per cercare di cambiare le istituzioni culturali in Italia è quella eh, di fare quella mh, che si chiama nel gergo open innovation, che poi è quella che fanno anche le grandi organizzazioni, le grandi aziende. Tutte le grandi aziende a loro volta, anche se vivono il mercato, il settore privato, hanno difficoltà a creare innovazione all'interna e quindi la comprano, adesso in maniera sintetica, nel mondo dell'innovazione e dal mondo delle start-up. Allora mi sono chiesta come possiamo fare per fare in modo che anche le istituzioni culturali possano fare la famosa open innovation. Allora, parlando anche con alcuni ehm, esponenti politici, una, un, un metodo ci sarebbe ed è anche abbastanza semplice. Faccio un esempio, il settore del, dello spettacolo dal vivo, in Italia, parliamo di tutti i teatri italiani, il mondo dello spettacolo dal vivo è finanziato dal pubblico, dal Ministero della Cultura e da un fondo che si chiama FUS, Fondo Unico per lo Spettacolo. Allora, eh, voi dovete pensare che in Italia eh, il Fondo Unico dello, per lo Spettacolo per il 50% è assorbito da 14 fondazioni lirico-sinfoniche che sono i teatri La Scala di Milano, di Roma, Venezia, Palermo, eccetera. 
Allora, se voi vedete i criteri con cui vengono assegnati eh, i soldi ai vari teatri, mh, eh, i criteri sono le legati alle alzate di sipario, quanti spettacoli di lirica vengono fatti, quante coproduzioni internazionali vengono fatte. Nessuno ha mai pensato di inserire tra i criteri di assegnazione del FUS fare progetti di innovazione. Allora questo alla politica non costerebbe nulla, non dovrebbe mettere altri soldi, ma semplicemente dovrebbe dare delle indicazioni, e questo è il ruolo poi del policy making, delle indicazioni alle istituzioni culturali affinché mh, per poter prendere eh, maggior soldi dal fondo unico dello spettacolo debbano fare innovazione al proprio interno e all'esterno delle proprie eh, istituzioni culturali. Allora questo è un esempio concreto di come la politica eh, possa fare, svolgere il suo ruolo per promuovere l'innovazione. Io sono certa che tutti i sovrintendenti dei teatri, che tutti i direttori dei musei, se sapessero che per fare in modo che eh, le loro istituzioni vengano finanziate devono attivarsi e capire che cos'è eh, fare progetti di innovazione, sono sicura che tutti i direttori di, dei teatri si attiverebbero per eh, farlo e creerebbero dei progetti per eh, attivarlo. Allora, io mh, ho un sogno, il mio sogno sarebbe che l'Italia si candidasse a diventare la culture technician, anche perché noi siamo ormai fuori da qualsiasi circuito insomma, in cui possiamo sicuramente dettare una linea sul mondo dell'innovazione. Allora, visto che il mondo della cultura non è stato ancora, come dire, eh, preso di mira, devo dire, in nessun paese del mondo, probabilmente per il problema che c'è poi in tutto il resto del mondo, che la cultura è in mano pubblica e quindi è difficile poi creare il mercato per le famose eh, start up da eh, incubare, da accelerare, da far crescere. Ma penso che le start up hanno un obiettivo specifico, quello di risolvere dei problemi. L'Italia di problemi da risolvere sul mondo della cultura ne ha immensi, quindi io credo che sia il luogo perfetto dove poter creare le condizioni di costruzione di un ecosistema sul culture tech e quindi spero che insomma, si possa lavorare insieme per realizzare questo sogno. Grazie, Grazie mille. And now, Florian, you're the last one, uh, but for sure bringing a very valuable experience. Representing Munich, um, for sure, uh, thinking about Germany, we don't usually think about Munich as the hub of startups, but uh, knowing the city and knowing how vibrant is the ecosystem, it is actually a model uh, for all the European countries, but I think also worldwide. Could you tell us more about how the process of building your own ecosystem was structured, how you managed to engage your local corporates, uh, and uh, what is the role within the ecosystem? Hi, buddy, this is Florian, and sorry for being late to the party. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Yes, we are part of scale on international level. Um, I can't see you. Should you, can you stand up? <laughs> so, all right, hello, buddy, I'm Florian, and uh, sorry for being too late to the party. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Yes, we are part of scale since way back and uh, being part of internationality is really important but let's take a step back to 2015 where the city of Munich was more or less like focused on themselves because they had to build up their own ecosystem as you um, raised the question how we did it and back in 2015 the city of Munich um, as it before was focused on themselves. So they made up a strategy with its stakeholders. So uh, we had the city of Munich, we had the Chamber of Commerce, and we had all the entrepreneurship centers of the universities coming together to one table and uh, yeah, heading their heads around how we can elevate the city of Munich and becoming part of an international um, ecosystem. So back then, still working? Um, back then they, yeah, derive the strategy in order to um, put it into one place. So that's where Munich Startup was born. Munich Startup is a online portal, which is all things about startup. So we covering all, it's, it's more or less a triangle. On the first pillar, we have startup and startup stories and making startups famous in and around Munich. So we have the stories, we have the portraits, we have the applied technologies, for example, a startup is uh, trying to 
get into blockchain. So we're trying not to only um, explain blockchain as a technology for the 36th time, but we also like try to, to cover the story, what is the startup actually doing and, and how do they apply uh, blockchain, for example. On the second pillar, we do have all the public authorities and as I said before, the stakeholders. So like the universities, the uh, entrepreneurship centers, the incubators, the um, accelerators, and all that kind of partners in the network. And on the third pillar for Munich Startup, we have the funding, the VC capitals, and uh, all the big ones which want to have their fair share if they uh, funding, for example, a company like Flixbus and yeah, scaling them up on an international level. So that are the three pillars Munich Startup is focusing on. And that's how we started way back in 2015 to covering the local ecosystem. And now, fast forward 2019, I'm standing here for you and on an international conference at the Rome Startup Week and trying to build something with the scale team. And what we do right now is we want to attract more international people. As I said before, it's not really the hub, the hub for international people besides Berlin and Hamburg, but we want to be number one, who or not. But um, in order to do that, uh, one of our newest um, projects is to build a Munich Urban Colab. Uh, just a, I think, weeks ago, we broke ground on the huge building and it's more or less a mixture of living laboratories, um, office space, maker space, and uh, just a generic space to exchange thought and uh, nurture innovation. And we, yeah, I think the stakeholders are pretty obvious, like I said before, the, 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 the three um, triangles. So we have the startups in the urban lab, we have the um, incubators, and we also have the funding and the corporates. So in order to attract more internationality, we need to break out of our comfort zone. And um, because Munich is really uh, known for its vertical domain expertise, like automotive, life science, intertech, and uh, fintech. So in order to become more international, we need to build yeah, bridges like Scale does and uh, invite other international hotspots to yeah, get out of the comfort zone and uh, see new domain expertise, like mobility, like uh, healthcare, and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're trying here in 2019. It's, it's our, let's say, homework gap year uh, to, to structure things and come back strong in 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before finishing our, our conference, I have some specific uh, question for our panelists. And if you have some question, please uh, prepare them so that we can go quickly and, and, and ask them. Uh, so first of all, uh, Sebastian, uh, I, I think uh, Startup Chile is a policy that nowadays is considered a worldwide model of success uh, for the public sector to actually take an active part within the startup ecosystem. Uh, can you? briefly sum up the importance of internationalizing their own startup ecosystem. What is the role of contamination? What is the role of bringing actively people to your own country? So for us, internationalization works in both ways, bringing people to Chile and taking the people out of Chile. So the important thing, as I was telling at the beginning, is the, the most important thing about foreigners is they are adding diversity into our ecosystem. Because uh, there was a super traditional mindset in our country. If you see Chile in the map, you will see that in the north, we have the driest desert in the world. In the south, we have the Antarctica. In one side, we have the Pacific Ocean. And in the other side, we have the, the Andes, basically. So Chile is isolated, even from, the, from, from Latin America. And let's not even talk about the rest of the world, you know? So all the people were thinking locally. Everybody just think like the same. All the entrepreneurs were coming from the same universities, same schools, same backgrounds, you know? So nothing innovative was coming out of that. So the importance of bringing foreigners, it was like a role model for us. First, to put more innovative capabilities into our ecosystem. And secondly, to prove the Chileans that it is possible to launch global businesses fr from the end of the world, you know? So in one side, bringing all those foreigners into our, into our country, change our culture, and we can see those results right now. At the beginning, everybody was just kind of like, why, why are you bringing foreigners, you know? And the good thing about the government, since this, is, this was a public policy, uh, it was the long-term view. Uh, it's super hard uh, from the public kind of uh, point of view, just thinking in a long term. 
you know. Um, and I always uh, think that that was one of the good things about the government. Uh, they said, okay, let's start a Chile play. Let's do what, what they are doing. Let's make their, uh, let's do their thing and let's wait. And now we can see results. And in the other side, as, as Thomas was, was saying, uh, if we were concentrated in Santi making Santiago our capital as a hub, we were doomed. So the most important part was connecting all the dots in order to position ourselves. And that's what we're doing in Startup Chile. We partner with other institutions around the world, uh, public programs, accelerators, incubators, public funds, uh, venture funds, or whatever, in order to help our startups to scale. So basically, we're telling all our partners, hey, look, our, look at our portfolio. We have interested solution for you. And if you're looking for a specific solution, you can browse what we have there. And at the same time, we can help our startup to scale through our partners. So internationalization, as I was telling you at the beginning, both works both ways, into Chile and coming out of Chile. Thank you. Jose Carlos, um, I've been so happy to come to Angola and, vis uh, and visit um, a recently funded ecosystem that is actually very active. Uh, can I ask you, what do you need uh, if you had to just pick one aspect to really boost your growth? And what could you offer as a static ecosystem for other ecosystems to learn? Uh, we're really Sorry, we're really keen on connecting, right? And uh, this was an important point that was mentioned here. And we, we've been able, through connections, to really build things that are regional. So one good example of this is that uh, Mozambique, which is a Portuguese colony as well, doesn't have a lot going on, but we've been able to cross-pollinate programs or initiatives with our accelerator. So we're able to scale the startups to two different markets just coming from Angola. But um, you mentioned Portugal as well. So this cultural interchange is really important for us. As a, a, a country, we're changed to open, so we're welcoming everybody in for businesses. Uh, one good thing that is happening in May, we, we're gonna be hosting the World Tourism Forum for the first time back home. So this is, this is a sign that things are, are moving. In terms of help, I would say education. Um, because that's the basis, and we don't have it. And um, this will be really important to, to build up the talent, but um, we, we're, we're not gonna be able to build it by ourselves. So we're welcoming to mentorship from, from anywhere in the world, people wanting to participate on boards of our startups, we're engaging people to come in and, and to really cut through the difficulties that we have. Um, one thing that is really interesting on, on ecosystems, and I was saying that the world is small and it's becoming smaller uh, for us, is that through connections, we're able to find a friend of a friend of a friend, and all of a sudden you're, uh, you know, marking a trip to Chile. And I'm, I know I'm going there like soon. And this is the same thing that happened to us. But uh, other than the connections is what you can find out in terms of um, diversity on the verticals that you can work on ecosystems. So I'll give you a good example. I like uh, new space. And uh, Chile has an observatory. And uh, that's fascinating for me. And I like the stars and I like all the new space search. And speaking to people who have been venturing this into Africa, building nano satellites and etc., cetera, um, I mentioned there's nothing going on in Angola. He told me, set up an event um, and you'll be surprised that people were, are gonna pitch up. And that's what happened. So first event, 30 people. And what I found out, there were like kids, 15 year old, 18 year old people, like developing nano satellites in their houses. So, you know, it's amazing when you search for talent and when you build it up correctly, what you can actually come as an outcome. So, I'll, I'll be hoping Angola will be in the map for the next 20 years. I won't be so <laughs> aggressive in terms of time. But I think inviting people in will be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Alexei, I just want to ask you, what is the main strand, what is the main characteristic of uh, the Belarus ecosystem, the Minsk ecosystem you can actually promote abroad? I will ask you later. Thank you very much. No, Thomas, uh, I was very interested about what you're saying. I, if I understood well, you're saying that building startup ecosystem is becoming a new profession. Uh, if we follow this line, what are the main skills that an ecosystem builder should have? Good question. So, yes, it's becoming a profession by, um, I think, by the many organizations in Europe, the NGOs, the public um, authorities that set up organizations with often quite big budgets to foster the, the ecosystems. Not all of this is, um, not all of this makes sense. So there's a, there's a lot of noise there and there's a lot of goodwill with, with um, little understanding of, of what people should be doing. So I'm saying it's becoming a, a profession because there is this group of people um, that is growing and they are trying to find their role. I think there can be a role, but we are far from having it. So there's a lot of things being done that still make no sense at all, a waste of money. But that's okay, that's why we start. Um, so I think the main skill that we need to develop at the moment is understanding the, understanding the startup world as an outsider. Understanding if you're not an investor and if you're not a startup yourself, understanding the fast pace they have and which role you can play to support. This is really complex systems. It's, it is a complex system of so, uh, interchange that you can discuss academically to at length, but you also need to be uh, practically able to provide services, I think it's a services business, um, provide services to those that are trying to build um, ventures, be it investors, be it startups, that helps them to do that faster. Thank you. Well, Priya, um, the first time I heard about Startup Amsterdam and I had the chance to meet uh, Ruben and Bas, uh, I was amazed, uh, I was actually shocked about how structured was your strategy and how ambitious were your goals. Uh, for example, you were not uh, having the ambition of attracting startups, it was about scale-ups. Here in Rome, we're not even thinking about scale-ups. This is just to set up two different mentalities about the two cities. Can you tell us more about how you actually um, coordinated the strategy between all the stakeholders composing the ecosystem, and how important is the strategy behind the project of building a startup ecosystem? Well, I wasn't there from the founding father's moment, uh, but I can just tell you a little bit about yeah, what the vision behind it was, and actually it's most important to tell you that after the four years of that program, that in January we just got the uh, go-ahead from our city uh, council to operate now for another four years. So that's actually the thing that we are um, more not promoting but trying to talk about now is that we we shifted our focus a little bit from, yes, we are at a different stage to other ecosystems in Europe in the sense that we, we really had to shout for four years to put Amsterdam on the map and, and that was really the job of Ruben and Bas, our founders, um, at the beginning was to make all these connections with, if we call ourselves a public-private initiative because we are publicly funded, we are completely set up under a government uh, program, but we make so many connections with private entities that now a lot of our initiatives are operating privately. So in that way we really operated like the startup because we did a lot of research into the needs, spoke a lot with entrepreneurs around the table about what they wanted in Amsterdam and what they thought our role should be. And then we did a lot of research about this. We ran the programs and now we've sort of given them to the market and, and a lot of them do operate like this. Focusing now for the following four years, what do we think is important? It's to 
yes, stop shouting and try to focus on the startups that we helped get to a certain stage. And now, how can they go into the world? So this is why programs like Scale, Startup City Alliance Europe are really important to us now because we want to help our startups go into the world. And and if you have an idea about Dutch culture, that's that's not doesn't come from uh, instinct. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Hope that answers. Sorry. So there's a question for you. Um, I think one of the main aspects that uh, is actually characterizing Milan as a very dynamic city in terms of startup is the very good connection with uh, the big university you have in Milan uh, in order to let startups experiment, to let startups find partners, mentors. Can you tell us more about uh, what's the role of universities and how uh, active are the universities in Milan? Because here in Rome we have a huge network of universities that is not as connected to our startup ecosystem as I see it is in Milan. Qua a Roma la situazione è diversa, eh, è importantissimo che il pubblico appunto si riappropri un po' dell'innovazione, ma nel caso in cui non riesca da solo, qual è il ruolo del privato per stimolare il pubblico a fare entrare l'innovazione al, al cuore della propria agenda? Ma sicuramente il privato può dare uno stimolo molto importante in termini di competenze e di strategia, perché eh, come abbiamo detto questa mattina, eh, molto spesso della pubblica amministrazione mancano queste competenze e eh, non significa che non ci sia una volontà di acquisirle, è chiaro che bisogna creare le condizioni. Eh, la cosa eh, positiva secondo me in, questo, in questa fase storica è che abbiamo un governo che è particolarmente attento al mondo dell'innovazione, al mondo delle start-up, tra l'altro segnalo che il Ministero della Cultura ha istituito un sottosegretario con la delega sull'innovazione. Questa è stata una cosa assolutamente è la prima volta che succede. È chiaro che eh, creare un, um, dire, un sottosegretario che si occupi di innovare il mondo della cultura non significa creare 
un ecosistema, però è già la dimostrazione della volontà della politica di voler dialogare con il mondo del, del privato e quindi sono eh, convinta che il ruolo del, dell'imprenditoria è un ruolo cruciale eh, che deve però lavorare in maniera veramente sinergica con il mondo della politica, con il mondo delle istituzioni e deve aiutare poi il mondo della pubblica amministrazione a poter crescere le proprie competenze. Certo, grazie mille. Tobias, so, 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 I have a question for you. Uh, I was very interested about the pack of measures that the Kenyan government actually proposed uh, to uh, implement a strategy about startups and innovation. Uh, do you think it's just a, a set of political measures or do you think it's also a matter of uh, creating a physical hub uh, or creating a specific uh, policy like Startup Chile? Uh, does it take just a ma macroeconomic uh, action or do you really need to do something specifically targeting the startup ecosystem to achieve the goal? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, what we are doing, we have adopted a two-prong approach from the political pillar and from the economic pillar. From the political pillar, we are trying to be able to create a conducive environment that is stable, that can support businesses to grow every time, but by appropriate legislation, laws, and policies. From the economic and, and uh, technological pillar, we are building, for example, a city that is purely dedicated for technology. We have Kongsa City, which was conceived in 2010. It is under construction, and uh, it is modeled on the city in Malaysia called Putrajaya, which is purely a technology city. So this we are building. The whole of the Department of Government of Kenya on ICT will be moved to that place. We have done the infrastructure there and young startups that would like to try their luck in the technology field, they are going to have spaces there. And at the moment, in line with this, we also have two universities. There's a private university called Strathmore, which has got a high hub, it's the iHub center right now. And it works with many, many uh, universities outside of Kenya. So what we are doing, as I said, we are approaching it from all the pillars, not only one from a macroeconomic macro perspective, from political, from cultural, and the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Florian, uh, once again, I, I would like to stress you on the good example of collaboration at the German level, but uh, the corporate industry and uh, the startups, but with the involvement of the public sector. What is the role of the public sector in fostering the collaboration between big industries and newcomers in the market? All right, let me be polite and get up once again. I think that's the downside to me today. Um, yeah, and uh, to your question, what the public sector is actually doing for the ecosystem. Um, Let's go back again to 2015 and uh, once we, we had all the big heads on, around the table and talking about strategy, uh, the local strategy back in 2015, um, the public sector was more or less like actually the head of the whole strategy, let's, let's put it that way, because they were like yeah, the city of Munich and uh, they, they own the land, they own, yeah, they, they own all the, the, the spaces and they are more or less the guys who are signing spaces or let's say substituted spaces for startups which are actually cheaper and so they are like more or less like the spider in the web trying to really like push each startup, each stakeholder, each uh, partner to the right direction and to the right partner. So I think the public sector or the public city of Munich is more or less in the, sense the spider in trying to organize the whole event. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.